Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 26th lecture of the Ant Biology webinar series. I am Nandita, and I will be coordinating today's session. So, Ant Biology webinar series is organized by the Translational Research Group, Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta, which aims to showcase the latest advances in the field of biology as well as the interdisciplinary areas. So before we begin, I would like to remind our viewers that you can post your question in the YouTube chat box and we shall moderate them towards the end of the lecture. And the feedback link will be provided near the end of the session. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Raghavendra Gadukar from Indian Institute of Science and Dr. Anindita Bhadra from ISER Kolkata. So uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Inare Banerjee, the mentor and convener of the webinar series, to welcome our guest. So over to you, Mike. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, very warm welcome to all our viewers. Um, good evening and good morning. And whichever time of the, of the day it is for our viewers, wherever you're watching us from, and for all the future viewers who will be tuning in, a very warm welcome. Uh, and biology, as Nondita uh, explained, uh, was conceptualized by one of my students uh, who poked me one um, uh, midnight my time and morning his time. And we started this series of seminars, um, webinars. Uh, and then uh, a year later, here we are. And another of my students, Anindita, a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Anindita Bhadro from ISAR, uh, who Nondita will be introducing in a bit, and Professor Agobendra Gadakar, who is her teacher as well. A very warm welcome, Professor Gadakar. We've been talking for, for quite a while. Uh, and then uh, we were just chatting before the show that unless the time is right, things don't happen. So this is the right time, and this is a wonderful moment that we have been able to connect. Um, and um, uh, uh, and Biology uh, welcomes you uh, on behalf of all the students who are otherwise homebound, not able to um, you know, learn hands-on stuff, both in field and in labs. On behalf of them, I thank you for coming on our platform, and the stage is yours. So, Nandita may introduce our uh, guest moderator, Anindita. Special, special thank you for, for doing this. And um, we are all agog to listen to whatever our speaker, very special speaker tonight has to say. Thank you. So, now I would like to introduce our guest moderator, Dr. Anindita Vajro. Dr. Bhadra is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences of ISAR Kolkata. She is also the associate dean of international relations and outreach in ISAR Kolkata. She is the former student of Professor Gadakar and past co-chairperson of Global Young Academy, founding chair and alumnus of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. So this was a very brief introduction, ma'am. So now I would like to request uh, Dr. Vadra to please take over. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Nandita. And thanks a lot, Inati, for asking me to moderate this session. It's a great pleasure and honor for me. Uh, Professor Gadakar is a very, very well-known, renowned uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, animal behaviorist, and ecologist in India. He has had a long and uh, fantastic career, especially studying social wasps, uh, on which I too did my PhD with him. Uh, he has a great CV, and I don't think he wants me to read out his long CV to all of you. You can always find him uh, in the uh, on his uh, web page, which is always updated. But uh, for the benefit of the audience and the organizers, I will just uh, briefly introduce him to you. Uh, Professor Gadakar, as I always tell my students, is someone who has uh, built his entire career in India. And that's, I think, very relevant for students of today. He did his PhD at the Indian Institute of Science and his entire life, uh, he has worked at the Indian Institute of Science at the Center for Ecological Sciences mostly. Uh, he has uh, studied uh, before that at uh, Bangalore itself, uh, doing his graduation and master's uh, in Bangalore University. He has worked for more than 30 years on the paper wasp 
uh, uh, which is a social wasp the, uh, called Ropilaria marginata. Some people call it the Indian paper wasp. Uh, and also on Ropilaria cytoformis, two very closely related species. He's also interested in other social insects, as you will find out from his talk today, like honeybees and ants. He has numerous honors and accolades to his name, starting from the Shanti Swarabhat Nagar Prize, which is the you know, highest honor in Indian science, uh, to uh, the latest uh, honor that he received from the Animal Behavior Society uh, in the US, uh, which is the Outstanding uh, uh, animal behaviorist, which is a lifetime achievement award given by the society. And obviously, you understand how important and eminent that award is. Uh, he has written a very, very popular uh, book called Survival Strategies, which is the first book I recommend to every student, and which is the first book on animal behavior, which I read as an undergrad student and got interested in the subject. And I recommend this to every student who I come across. It's a great read. This book has been translated into other languages like Korean and Chinese, uh, but you can read it in English. You can buy it on Amazon. Uh, you can buy it at your local bookstore. It's a great book to start uh, your journey of, uh, you know, on animals, on animal behavior. He also has a more technical book, uh, which is uh, on the uh, social biology of Ropilaria marginata. And recently, uh, the Indian Academy of Science uh, published uh, a series of his articles in the journal Resonance, which is now available as one book, which is uh, fantastic uh, to read. Uh, it is a book which introduces students and anyone interested in animal behavior to uh, very easy to do intelligent experiments on animal behavior, which are not expensive, which anyone can do with some basic interest in animal behavior and uh, mm -hmm. some brains. And that is very important, especially in the scenario in India, and especially in the scenario that we are in today, where you are locked up at home, you could become an animal behaviorist just using very simple techniques of observing animals. This book is highly recommended to one and all. He currently also writes uh, a uh, column in the wire science which is published uh, fortnightly and again a fantastic read each uh, uh, you know article is extremely well researched has a lot of food for thought and has a lot of uh, you know take home messages and has a nice and interesting uh, wish list for reading which avid readers can click on find out what to read next and uh, latch on to uh, Professor Gadakar is not just interested in science. He is one of those rare scientists who is uh, constantly engaged in science outreach, science education. He's a fantastic teacher. I can definitely vouch for it. He has mentored a large number of students, taught the undergrad course in biology at IISC, and he uh, was involved at the Center for Contemporary Studies as the founding chairperson, uh, which was a great department which brought together people from outside of the sciences to the campus and people on campus and even people in Bangalore outside the campus regularly came to CCS to attend these talks, interact with the speakers and get to know about how research is done in other fields because scientists often uh, you know, tend to be uh, very clustered and uh, very clustered in their own uh, lives and they don't talk to people outside their peer group but uh, Professor Gadakkar ensured that people in ISC were exposed to thinking processes in other fields so that was another brilliant um, uh, idea of Professor Gadakkar which was brought to fruition in ISC and uh, he uh, 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 successfully led the Center for Contemporary Studies until uh, his superannuation. Uh, currently, Professor Gadakar continues his research and uh, continues his writing and teaching from the Center for uh, Ecological Sciences uh, in IIC as a chair professor, uh, the Year of Science Chair Professor of DST, which is again a great honor. I think I will uh, stop my introduction of him here because uh, I can uh, imagine that all of you are more eager to listen to him talking about the science than me talking about him. And I could just go on and on talking about him. So uh, more later when you have questions and answers, and I hope there will be a lot of questions which I can take up and uh, he can answer. So over to you, sir. Uh, we all look forward to the talk now. Thank you can be, 
Well, first of all, I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Banerjee for not only for inviting me, but for her patience in waiting till we could uh, get everything together in one uh, in one on one evening. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation, and I think this is a great initiative that you have taken, and I am delighted to be able to reach such a large number of students, which I may not have been able to do even if I came in person to uh, Calcutta University. So this is we must take. And look at the bright side of this and take advantage of this. I have been able to attend so many seminars during this uh, pandemic period, which I would not have been able to do before. So we should look at the bright side. And I've been able to talk to so many people. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Nandita for in, uh, organizing this, for uh, setting this up. And particularly, I want to thank Anindita, my former student, for the very generous introduction. Uh, I have benefited as much from my students or more than my students might have benefited from me. If you take one student at a time, definitely I have benefited much more than uh, uh, from all the students put together. So teachers are really what their students make them. That's what I really think. So teachers are what students make them. And my students have uh, done a good job, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with what I'm doing. So I'm going to start this talk and I'm going to try and make it very general because I don't know the composition of the audience. Probably the audience is uh, quite heterogeneous, but I won't make it, uh, make it very technical at all. Uh, I have, is my audio coming uh, okay? Any problem? Anindita, is my audio okay? Yes, sir. Audio is fine. Uh, the slides are fine. So this is my first slide. I have called this talk Wasp Queens and House Hunting Bees. And the subtitle is Can We Learn From Them? So we, of course, I'm referring to human societies. So more generally, can human societies learn from insect societies? That's a broad uh, topic. But instead of talking at a philosophical level, I want to take very specific examples of what insect societies do and ask the question, whether we can actually learn from them. But I will address this in a very broad way. Uh, so I'll, the two specific example I'll take is about wasp queens and about house hunting ants. But let me begin by giving a brief introduction to insect societies. As most of you would know, many species of insects, particularly ants, bees, wasps, termites, they live in what we can legitimately call societies. They live in colonies, but these colonies are really very much like human societies. Uh, they parallel human societies in many ways, and I would argue that in some ways they are better than human societies. They have uh, not only group living, but they have uh, division of labor, they have communication, they have coordination, uh, almost all things that we do they have. And let me start with a few examples. Perhaps the best known insect society is that of the honeybee. As you know, honeybees live in these pop large populous colonies of tens of thousands of individuals and they build a nest made of wax and they spend their entire life there. They bring up offspring and within a colony, you will find that there are, although there are tens of thousands of bees, you will find that there are only three kinds of bees. There is a single large fertile queen bee. She's the only one who is mated and who reproduces uh, laying eggs, both uh, diploid and haploid eggs to produce sons and daughters. And then there are a small number of males or drones, which uh, are not actually there all the time, depending on the season. And the males really uh, mature in the colony of their birth. Then they leave to participate in mating flights where they mate with virgin queens of other colonies and actually die in the process of mating. So they do not contribute to the labor in the colony, to the social behavior of the colony. So almost all the work that is required to run the society is performed by the so-called worker bees. The worker bees are slightly smaller and they are nearly sterile. And in fact, all the bees you see here are the worker bees. The queen is somewhere hidden behind this curtain. But uh, in the next slide, I will show you what the queen looks like. So the first slide was the Asian dwarf bee, Apis floria. But this particular slide is about the uh, European bee, Apis mellifera. And in the center of this picture, you see this large queen bee and she is surrounded by a group of worker bees. Now, typically, if you locate the queen, you'll find that she's always surrounded or to use our language, she's attended by a small group of workers. And you will find that these workers are really taking care of the queen. They are cleaning the queen, they're licking the queen, they're feeding the queen. It looks as if she doesn't have time to do any of these 
things herself because she is very busy finding a suitable place an empty cell to lay her next egg and she can lay thousands of eggs per day so basically she consumes food converts them into eggs and keeps laying eggs that's one of her may really one of the two roles that she performs in the body the other role is that she produces pheromones pheromones are chemicals that individuals release which act outside the body which act on other individuals and she produces pheromones which help regulate the activities of the colony and in fact these workers who are attending to the queen in fact we call this the royal retinue of workers you, you again in using our language we can say that these workers are on royal duty and while performing their royal duty of cleaning and licking, licking and feeding the queen they acquire these chemicals which the queen produces and when they go off and work in other parts of the colony they are transmitting this so the whole colony is able to share these chemicals that the queen produces very very rapidly so a typical worker bee works at home for the first half of its life which may be 2 to 3 weeks so she builds the nest she cleans the nest she feeds the larvae she processes food she guards the nest she removes dead bees all of that she does in the first half of her life in the second half of her life usually she goes out in search of food and the food of honey bees consists of pollen and nectar which she locates finds brings back to the nest and usually performs a dance and through this dance language she is communicate able to communicate to other bees at home what she has found including how much how far and how to get there and the bees at home which watch this dance this uh, famous honey bee dance language which uh, carl von frisch discovered and for which he got the nobel prize in 1973 those who watch the dance have enough information to go and locate maybe just one particular tree 5 to 10 kilometers away which is which has flowers with nectar in it without any further help from the original dancing bee so that's the power of of this language and you can see in the next picture there's a bee here in flight she is uh, gathered pollen and nectar so they keep the nectar in their crop so that it doesn't get digested and they stack pollen on so called pollen baskets in their hind legs and then deliver all of this back to the nest and as i said returning home they perform a dance and if the food is far away they perform a dance called the vagal dance in which they actually use the angle between the azimuth of the sun their own hive and the food source they measure this angle and they are able to use this angle to perform the dance at home back i won't go into the details of this a charming train goes by outside my window from time to time and i just pause when that happens okay now as evolutionary biologists we are fascinated by insect societies in general and honey bees in particular because of what we call altruism so here is a picture of a honey bee that has just stung a human being a volunteer human being and once the bee stings you it is not able to withdraw its sting from your body because the sting has barbs pointing outwards and when she tries to withdraw her abdomen ruptures and she is forced to leave behind the sting the poison gland associated with the sting and a part of her digestive system only to fly away and die within a few minutes but this poison gland which is still sticking to your body continues to pump venom into your body and people have measured this for up to 60 seconds after the bee has flown away now you can imagine that this technique of leaving your sting and poison gland behind even though you are going to die makes for a very efficient venom delivery mechanism but it comes at the cost of the life of the bee and yet many of you would have experienced that the bee will not hesitate to sting you if you mess with its call this act of altruism is something that is of great interest to evolutionary biologists because on the face of it it should be weeded out by natural selection natural selection is survival of the fittest those individuals who survive and reproduce better than others are supposed to dominate the future populations but here is an individual which is killing itself and yet natural selection has favored such a behavior and how natural selection could be a select for such self sacrificing altruistic behavior is a major uh, paradox in evolutionary biology and one of the most active areas of research and i and my students have been working on this 
But here I'm just giving you a flavor of insect societies. Now, of course, honeybees are not the only insect societies. There are 10 to 15 species of honeybees, but there are 15,000 species of ants, and all of them are show exquisite sociality. Here is a picture of a large number of ants trying to bend two leaves together in order to stitch a nest. And you can see the number of ants that are involved and how they make bridges of ants from one leaf to the other. And then when the ants in the middle of this bridge drop off, the bridge becomes narrower and narrower and then the leaves come together. And when the leaves come together, they actually stitch the edges of these leaves with silk thread. Where do they get the silk thread? Adult ants cannot produce silk. But larvae can produce silk. But larvae normally in most species produce silk for their own good, for making their own protective cocoons when they become pupae. But in this species, the larvae donate their silk for the communal nest. They don't make cocoons for themselves at all. All the silk that larvae produce is donated. And in fact, here you can see an adult has picked up a appropriately sized larva and one might say that she is squeezing her appropriately and persuading her to donate silk. And you can see these silk threads with which they make this nest. And that is how they, these ants survive. Now we just have to think and ponder what kind of instincts make the ants do this. How much coordination is needed? How much cooperation is needed? How do they know that the leaf is properly aligned? How do they know which larva is the appropriate one? So, you know, these are things we can endlessly ponder about. Of course, you're all familiar with termites, which are also highly social insects. Uh, there's a lot of interest in termites also because they are quite destructive uh, to our houses and so on. But termites are also extremely interesting in the, in, in the terms of their social life. Here is an artist's conception of what might happen under the ground in a termite nest. Now, termites are unusual uh, compared to ants, bees and wasps in Two ways. One is that in ants, bees and wasps, as I said, the males mate and die do not really participate in social life. But in termites, males also participate in social life. There's a king, if there's a queen, and there's also a king. There are male workers, there are also female workers. In fact, on this picture, you can see here, this large individual here is the queen termite. And next to her, this little individual is actually the king termite. Uh, he doesn't look very impressive, but he is the king and he actually continuously inseminates the queen as she lays thousands and thousands of eggs. The other speciality of many termite species is that the work required to run a society is actually done by the juveniles, is done by the immature stages. And in fact, these immature stages spend so much time working for the colony that they really have no time to become adults. They in fact die without ever becoming adults. And I say jokingly that this is the ultimate form of child labor that the, that the termites actually practice. That brings me to my fourth example of insect societies, the so-called social wasps. These, of course, as you can imagine, are my favorite because we really work on, on them. Now, there are many, many wasps in the world. Not all of them are social. A minority of them are social. And the social wasps are all called paper wasps. And the reason why they are called paper wasps is because they build their nest from paper, not from wax as honeybees do, not from leaves as ants do, not from soil as termites do, but in fact from paper. Now, where do they get the paper from? They actually manufacture paper. How do they manufacture paper? In much the same way that we manufacture paper. They scrape cellulose fibers from plants, chew it up, add their own secretions, make it into a fine pulp, spread it into a thin layer and dry it. In fact, it is paper. You can write on it. What you see in this picture is the nest of a large wasp where the entire nest is covered with a paper envelope. And you see there's just one opening here in the middle where the wasp can go in and out. Now, if we open this, which is a dangerous thing to do, but we did it very carefully once. When you do this, you will be rewarded with a wonderful site, which I like to call a multi-storied apartment complex. Now you can see here, there are several layers of paper foam. In fact, you can think of this as the ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor, floor, fifth, sixth. There are several, all of these are made of paper and all of these have hexagonal cells like the honeybees. And and you can see that the pupae, the, in fact, the pupae here again, have spun silk fibers to make the pupil cases and the wasp would come out of this. Now, 
let me summarize what all I have said about social insects. Insect societies resemble human societies in many ways and are arguably more efficient than ours in some ways. They sustainably harvest environmental resources. They engineer their environment both inside and outside their place. They practice agriculture. In fact, ants have been practicing agriculture for more than 50 million years. Our agriculture is only about 10 to 15,000 years. Their agriculture is 50 million years old. They fight disease with a combination of individual and social immunity. Something that we are trying very hard to do. We have individual immunity, but to get social immunity, as you know, in the last one and a half years, to, has been so difficult because it has to be done by appropriate behavior. But the insect societies have all the appropriate behaviors in order to generate social immunity. They organize social hunting parties. They navigate their environment using both terrestrial and celestial cues. See, many social insects go off kilometers away from their nest in search of food and they have to return back to the nest. And how do they make sure that they don't get lost? So there are elaborate mechanisms that they use. And insect societies have majorly influenced the evolutionary trajectories of other organisms, such as flowering plants, for example. We know that the flowering plants became so diverse and so successful because of their evolutionary partnership with bees. Because when bees pollinate, then only these flowering plants can reproduce. And this coevolution between bees even ants, social insects and flowering plants has resulted in the enormous diversity and success of flowering plants on today's earth. So social insects are quite remarkable. They do all of these things. The obvious question we must ask ourselves is, so can we humans not learn anything from insect societies? Can we actually learn from them? There are difficulties. And interestingly, the difficulties are not so much to do with them but with ourselves. Let me explain what these difficulties are. Now, first of all, there is a practical problem. And the practical problem is that we find everything in nature, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what do we copy? We can find suitable examples in nature to justify anything we want. Monarchy, no problem. There are examples. Slavery, there are examples. Murder, matricide, fratricide, infanticide, siblicide, or if you are differently inclined, democracy, socialism, egalitarianism, altruism, self-sacrifice, you can find examples of all of these in insect societies. And there is a problem with this. If you find so many things, you can justify whatever you want. So there is a philosophical problem. What is the philosophical problem? It has been called the naturalistic fallacy. What is the fallacy? Naturalistic fallacy is the tendency to draw a conclusion about how things ought to be, how things should be, based on claims concerning what is natural. So if you find democracy you, in, in social insects, you can say democracy is natural, so we should have it. But suppose you find autocracy, you can say autocracy is natural, so we should also have it. If you find simplicide in social insects, you can say simplicide is natural. So what's wrong in our doing the same thing? So as if naturalness were itself a kind of authority. The problem is the fact that you find something does not mean that you should do it. It not, does not constitute an authority. Now the question we should ask ourselves, we claim to be the most intelligent species on earth, can we hope to learn from nature? In in particular from insect societies, without committing the naturalistic fallacy. That is, we learn from them without justifying what we want to do, simply because we find it there. Let us start with some easy examples. Now, there are some very easy examples where it is relatively easy for us to learn from insect societies without committing the naturalistic fallacy. I'll take two or three examples. The first example I'll use is what is called ant colony optimization. Now, social insects are very, very efficient in the way they do things. Now, one of the reasons why they're efficient is they do not have top-down control. They have bottom-up self-organization. To take one very simple example, 
ants can, if there is a nest here and the food here, and there are two different ways of going there. One is a long path, one is a short path. We know that ants can choose the short path and use the short path. And the way they do this is extremely interesting. The way they do this is that they do not do this intelligently like we do. They do not measure the lengths of the paths, but they use pheromones. So when ants travel, they leave pheromones. So even if ants randomly walk on the long and short path, because the short path is short, more traffic happens automatically on the short path. So there is more pheromone and therefore more ants will be attracted to short path and very quickly everybody will use the short path. So this is what we call self-organization. There is no global intelligence. There is no global pattern. But individual ants follow simple local rules. In fact, in this case, the ants only have two rules. I should lay pheromones when I walk. I should follow the pheromone trails of other ants. With these two simple rules, if a large number of ants practice these rules simultaneously, you will get this global amazing pattern that they are able to choose the short path after, out of the two paths. Nobody knew there was a short path. Nobody knew that the short path is better, but this happens automatically. That is why it's called self-organization or it's called an emergent property. When a large number of individuals follow simple local rules, some global patterns emerge which were totally unexpected. Now, this knowledge has led people to apply it to human affairs. For example, this is one of the most remarkable things because based on this knowledge, computer scientists have developed a whole field called ant colony optimization. And the tricks that we learned from the ants, which are now used in computer programming, this ant colony optimization method or algorithm has been applied to a wide variety of human problems such as the traveling salesman problem, routing of communication networks, algorithms for data clustering, dynamic resource sharing, graph coloring, machine scheduling, vehicle routing, sequence learning, machine learning. In all of these, specifically the lessons learned from ad are being used. So here is something, a simple example how we could learn from insect societies. And the second example, slightly more complicated, but still reasonably okay. Ants, as I already mentioned, practice agriculture. So some species of ants, particularly the so-called leaf cutter ants in Central and South America, they go out, gather leaves, make those, break those leaves into small parts and bring them back to the nest. You see here is a picture of Professor Ulrich Muller, who has done the most interesting work on ant agriculture. Here is an ant which has actually cut a small piece of leaf and is carrying it back to the nest. When they reach the nest, other ants at home shred these leaves into small pieces, spread them in the garden and actually uh, plant. They don't use flowering plants, but they grow fungi. So fungi, myce fungal mycelia are brought here and a fungus garden is made. And it is the fungal spores they produce from their agriculture, which is what they feed on. An ant colony may have one million hungry mouths to feed, but all the food of all of these ants comes from the agricultural produce. They do not eat the leaves. They do not eat the leaves which they find in the environment, but they use the leaves to grow food and use them. Now you can imagine the kinds of problems their agriculture would have, very much like ours. There would be erosion of soil fertility, there would be pests, there would be various problems and how to make this sustainable. But for 50 million years, ants have managed to maintain their agriculture in a sustainable fashion. Fungus farming ants originated 50 million years ago. They use leaves to cultivate fungi. And among the many things that we can learn from them, I'll just mention one. They choose and manage microbial consortia, beneficial for nutrient uptake and disease resistance. So they use a consortia of microbes and they actually choose these and grow these. And some of them they grow on their bodies and the appropriate mix of microbes they use. And that's how they're able to both maintain fertility and therefore sustainability, take care of unwanted pests and keep their agriculture safe from these kinds of things. And there is a great deal we can learn from them. I'll take a third example and this has to do with robotics. Now, honeybees, as I already told you, they fly out of the nest in search of food. But once they find food, they are able to come back and perform a dance and tell the bees not only what they have found, but how far it is. Now, in order for them to be able to communicate the distance, 
they must first measure the distance. Now, how do bees measure the distance they have flown? Now, it turns out that they use a very interesting method. Honey bees measure distance flown by measuring what we call image motion on their eyes. So, uh, as you move, image moves backwards on your eyes. And the more the image has moved backwards, the further you have gone. And you, in fact, we humans can do this. So, they actually measure this. And a man called Mandiam Srinivasan did simple experiments to show that that's exactly what the bees do. They measure the amount of image motion on their eyes and that's how they determine how far they have flown. Now, this technique that the bees use can be applied in very interesting ways. In fact, flying insects are intelligent micro machines capable of exquisite maneuvers in unpredictable environments. Understanding these systems advances our knowledge of flight control, sensor suites, and unsteady aerodynamics, which is of crucial interest to engineers developing intelligent flying robots or micro vehicles. There's a whole book edited by Srinivas and others which discusses this topic, as there was a book on ant colony optimization in the previous slide that I showed you. Now, these are the easy examples where there is not much danger of the naturalistic fallacy. But when it comes to human affairs and moral philosophy, then things can become a little more difficult. <coughs> this is where there is the danger that we will find something in the insect societies and we will say that is the correct thing to do. We should also do that. So there, there is that danger. So let me talk a little bit about that. Now, the kind of work my students and I do on a social wasp called Rocladia marginata, which Anindita mentioned in the introduction, the lessons that we can learn from that actually are much more in the direction of human affairs and moral philosophy. So let me very briefly give you a glimpse of some of the kind of research that we do. The wasp we study is called Rocladia marginata. As Anindita says, we like to call this the Indian paper wasp. This is also a paper wasp. Luckily for us, it does not cover its nest with a paper envelope. So we can see everything. It builds small nests, which are basically two-dimensional, and the number of wasps is quite small. So it is very easy to study them. In fact, we can mark every wasp with little spots of colored paint, as you will see in this slide, and we can keep track of individual wasps. We can study the behavior of these individual wasps. The other interesting thing about these wasps is that unlike in the honeybees and ants, and unlike also the bigger wasps, the big wasp nest that you know, there is no morphologically different queen. All individuals look alike. They are physiologically nearly alike. One of them becomes the queen. But if she dies, another one can replace her and become the queen. This cannot happen in honeybees. If a honeybee queen dies, then they have to rear a young larva to become a future queen. An adult worker bee cannot become a queen bee. A queen bee is very different and she has to get the appropriate kind of she has to get the appropriate kind of nutrition in the larval stage in order to be born as a bee. So if a queen bee dies, they have to rear a new queen bee starting from young larvae. In this wasp, if the queen dies, one of the workers can immediately become the next queen. And this transition, of course, makes it very interesting. So for years, we have been studying this and we have been interested in knowing if the queen dies, who becomes the next queen? So because we mark all these individuals and we know who is whose offspring, we are able to construct pedigrees. So for example, here is a complex royal pedigree. These kinds of pedigrees are usually done for human royal families. And I'm very fond of saying that this was probably the first royal pedigree of an insect that we constructed in our lab. And you can see from this pedigree that can be quite complex. Queen 1, this is Queen 1, she was replaced by her daughter. Queen 2 was replaced by her sister. She was replaced by another sister. But Queen 4 was replaced by her niece. And Queen 7 was replaced by her cousin. And because of this, the kind of family system these wasps live in can be very complicated. So we have calculated, for example, that the relationship between queens and their immediate predecessors can be that of daughters, sisters, nieces, and cousins. And because of that reason, the relationship between workers and the brood they care for can be very complex. So workers may be feeding their sisters, brothers, nieces and nephews, cousins, cousins' offspring, mother's cousins, 
mother's cousin's offspring and even mother's cousin's grand offspring. I'm very fond of saying that this will put to shame any Indian joint family. This is the kind of complex family in which they live. Now, when you observe these wasps, we can actually show that there are three kinds of wasps in a colony. We have classified them into what we call sitters, fighters and foragers. These are not morphologically different, but they are behaviorally different. So we call them behavioral costs and we call this process as behavioral cost differentiation. Now, when we did this study in the early part of our research, we did not distinguish between queens and workers because they look alike. So all wasps can be classified into either sitter or fighter or forager. And this allowed us to ask, where is the queen? Now, we expected the queen to be a fighter because in other such species, the queen is known to be very aggressive in the but surprisingly, our queen was not a fighter. Our queen is a non-aggressive, non-interactive, meek and docile sitter. And this was very interesting because this raised the question, why do the workers respect her? Why do the workers accept her as a queen if she's a meek and docile sitter? And in order to understand this, we did experiments where we removed the queen to see what will happen. And we found to our great surprise that if you remove the queen, one of the workers becomes extremely aggressive but only for a short while and she will become the next queen. And if you don't return the queen, very quickly she will also lose her aggression and in about a week or 10 days, she will become a typical meek and docile queen. So new queens start, removal of docile queens makes workers, one worker hyper aggressive and this potential queen begins the career in a very aggressive way, but quickly becomes meek and docile when she starts laying eggs. This of course raises the question of who is this worker? The one which becomes the potential queen, can we identify her beforehand? Now, it turns out that it is very difficult to identify her beforehand. In the presence of the queen, she is cryptic. We cannot make out. She looks and behaves like any other worker. We cannot predict the identity of the potential queen in the presence of the queen because she is not unique by any criterion. She is not the most dominant worker. She is not unique in any other behavior. She doesn't have any specially developed ovaries. And if you look at, study the behavior in detail, you will find that the potential queens are indistinguishable from workers. Queens can be distinguished by behavior, but not potential queens. So this has been one of the greatest mysteries in our research, how to identify the potential queen beforehand. Now it turns out that even though we cannot identify, it turns out that we can ask whether the other wasps are aware of the identity of the individual. So we can ask the following kind of question. We can ask ask whether they can identify. So this research, in fact, I must mention, was done by Anindita Badra, who is moderating today's discussion. So she set up the hypothesis. In fact, we said, let us assume that there is a hair designate, even though we cannot identify her in the presence of the queen, and the wasp seemed to know who she is. Now, if this is true, then actually Anindita did experiments to show that it is exactly true, that this assumption is correct, that there is a hair designate, although we cannot identify her and only she becomes hyper aggressive and becomes the next queen. In fact, another student of mine showed that there is not just one hair designate, but there is a whole reproductive queue of hair designates. One after the other, they will become future queens without any conflict. And this kind of hair designates, especially a queue of hair designates, allows them to minimize within group conflict. So as soon as the queen dies, they don't start fighting with each other. Whatever fighting has to be done, they seem to do beforehand and it's already known who the next queen will be. So in a time of crisis, they do not have conflict. And that you can imagine is very efficient for the colony. So, but there is a lot of conflict between colonies. When members of one colony are introduced into the cage in another colony, then there's a lot of conflict. But the conflict is very nuanced. Young alien workers are admitted into the colony. Old alien workers are allowed to live but away from the nest and the alien queen is actually killed. In other words, they have a very nuanced, sophisticated way of showing aggression even to outsiders. So these wasps are capable of war and peace. The wasps have a great propensity to make war with outsiders and an equally great propensity to maintain peace with insiders. Even in the face of adversity, even when there is a crisis, even when the queen is dead, they do not fight with each other. From an evolutionary point of view, war with outsiders is easy to understand. But war with outsiders is not, is not of much use unless you can combine it with peace with insiders. And I think it is this dual strategy 
this ability to tread a fine balance between conflict and cooperation that I think accounts for the enormous success of insect societies, which is why we call them super organisms. This is the sort of su summary of one strand of research in my group. Now, with this, it is impossible not to think about humans. It is impossible not to relate to humans. It is impossible not to ask, can we learn with you? Now, if you look at it, if you look at what I have summarized in this slide, then an inevitable conclusion is that we humans are the same, aren't we? I'm very fond of quoting the French philosopher Voltaire, who said, it is lamentable that to be a good patriot, one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind. And that is what the wasps do. People often ask me, why do you study social wasps? And I answer, for the same reason that an anthropology studies humans. I, but I certainly do not think that we should imitate animal societies blindly, because that would constitute the naturalistic fallacy. But I do think they can hold a mirror to us and offer us a means to reflect on our own society and learn more about ourselves. Now, this is the extent to which I have gone in saying, what can we learn from insect societies? We can learn more about ourselves. Now, the question is, can we do more? Can we become bolder? Can we actually learn from things more directly? Now, I hope that we can find a middle ground so that we can learn from insect societies without suffering the ill effects of the naturalistic fallacy. And here is my prescription. How do we do this? How do we learn from insect societies without falling into the trap, using them to justify whatever we want? Let us always decide what we wish to do on our own, unmindful of whether we find it in nature or not, whether animals do it or not. First, we decide on our own what we want to do. Having made that decision, however, it is often useful to turn to nature to learn how to do it well. So we don't ask nature what to do, we ask nature how to do. What to do we decide on ourselves, so that there is no danger that we simply do something because insects do it, because it is there in nature. Okay, And this can be very dangerous as you know, because people who want to do the wrong things, who want to for example concentrate power in themselves, they say, but this is natural, this also happens in animals, so why should I not concentrate all power on myself, why should I not be a dictator? This is the danger and this danger can be avoided if we first decide what we want to do, but we turn to nature to see how to do. Now, because there is the danger that we will justify all the wrong things by saying it is already in nature, some people, especially some philosophers, say, let's forget nature. And my argument is you cannot forget nature. Nature is very much there. You are part of nature. So we should use nature to learn how to do. Now, I will want to take one particular example where this has been done extremely well. And here I will discuss research by a friend called Thomas Seeley. Thomas Seeley is a professor at Cornell University and he's written his, spent all his life working on honeybees and written a book with recently with a bold title, Honeybee Democracy. Now, he's not saying that we should have democracy because bees have it. But he's saying we have already decided that we want to be democratic. But how to be democratic? Can we learn something from the bees? Not that we should be democratic, but if having decided that we want to be democratic, how to do it? And I will very briefly describe his research. This brings me to the second part of my talk about house hunting bees. I talked about wasp queens. Now I'll talk about house hunting bees. Now the bees, Seeley studies are Apis mellifera, the western bees. These bees, bees typically build their nest in cavities, often in cavities in dead trees, as you can see on this slide. And this is actually the nest opening. Here is a blow up of that. So this is the opening. This is where the bees are. Now, when the, the cavity gets full, now the bee colony has no more place to grow. That's when the bee colony reproduces. And the colony reproduces meaning that it produces daughter colonies. Now, how do they, how do they produce daughter colonies? In order to every bee colony has only one queen. In order to produce at least one daughter colony, they have to rear a new queen, as I said, from the larval state. So when a new queen is rare, then two queens cannot live in the same colony. Then the colony can split. The new queen in one half, the old queen in the other half, the workers distributed between them. Now you have two colonies. But this happens in a very, very spectacular way. Invariably, the old queen, the mother queen, leaves this place 
with a group of workers and builds a new nest and the daughter queen inherits the old nest. Which makes a lot of sense because the old nest is already ready, it's protected, it has a lot of worker, it has a lot of uh, brood, it has a lot of wax, it's very convenient. Whereas the old queen takes the risk of going off and starting life all over again. So there is this invariable uh, culture, if you like, in honeybees, where always the mother leaves to take on the risky job of finding, building a new nest and the daughter has the comfort and safety and security of the old nest. But what does the mother do? The mother goes with a group of bees and they settle down in a place which we call the bee swarm. Now, like we do with our wasps, Sealy marks all his honeybee so he can keep track of them. And when the mother leaves with a group of workers settled on a place, we call that a swarm. Now, this is just a temporary place. There is no nest here. From here, the bees have to do this job of finding a suitable cavity and then moving there and building their nest there. And that is why these bees in a swarm can be called as house hunting bees. They are really hunting for a new place. When a daughter colony is produced, the mother queen leaves, as I said. The mother queen and her entourage of workers first settle down in a cluster nearby. From this cluster swarm, a few scout bees will fly in different directions in search of suitable cavities. Multiple scouts will advertise different potential nesting sites that have, they have visited and found attractive. By the way, bees have a very elaborate mechanism of deciding whether a cavity is suitable or not. The volume of the cavity, how high it is from the ground, where it is present, in what direction it is facing, what is the chance that rainwater will enter, what is the chance that sun will enter, and which direction is facing. They measure all these things and they assess how good it is. Having found something which is reasonably attractive, they will come home and dance. But the strength of their dance is proportional to how good they think it is. So they do not have an ego trying to say that mine is the best. They dance according to what they think it is. But all the bees have to eventually go to a single location. So several bees are advertising, saying I found one in that corner, one in this corner. How do they all come to a consensus? And that's why, how do they accomplish it? Or how do they accomplish this task of all the bees agreeing as to which site they go and to hopefully the best of the lot. And Seely says, these homeless insects will do something truly amazing. They will hold a democratic debate to choose their new home. They actually hold a debate to decide which one. Because there will be four, five, six things being advertised. They all have to do which one and they do it through a democratic debate. What do they do? So here is just a schematic. So there is the swarm in the middle and you can see in the upper panel, two bees are dancing for two different sites. And after some time, you will find that the number of bees dancing, the blue ones keep increasing, the red decreases. And finally, it is mostly blue and they all go to the blue, the blue site. In a real life data, we look like this. So there may be each arrow represents bees dancing for a particular new potential site. And you can see the number of sites which are being danced can increase, decrease, but eventually there will be only one site that is chosen and all of them will go there. How do they do this? After going there, the scout bees will release a pheromone and guide all the bees into the new way. So this is their collective decision making is of great interest because in a democracy, we want to make collective decision making. So how do the bees do this collective decision making? The strength of their dancers is proportional to their assessment of absolute quality of the quality of the site they found. So their dance will only be as good as they think their site is. A good site will elicit a strong dance and result in more followers. That is more bees will follow and go back and see that who will visit that site return to perform even more strong dances. A poor site will elicit a weak dance and result in fewer followers who will visit that poor site and return and perform weak dances. Hence, the number of bees that will dance in favor of the good and poor site will increase and decrease exponentially. Once a consensus is reached, scouts who are most familiar with the winning site invite <coughs> and lead the whole group to their new home and make these piping sounds to get there. Now, Actually, they don't even wait for a consensus. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. They, as soon as the majority of the bees agree on one thing, they, as soon as a quorum is reached, they will actually. Okay. 
Now, what is the honeybee wisdom we can learn from this? So Thomas Seeley has extracted the honeybee wisdom and he says it in this language. Their decision is based on attaining a quorum and not necessarily a consensus. This means that a single stubborn bee cannot hold the group to ransom, endlessly delaying this. So the first wisdom is they don't wait for total consensus. They want a quorum. Once the majority agree, then the ones who don't agree just quit the race and do not continue to insist. That's a, clearly a wisdom that I think we need to learn very badly in how humans make decisions. Bees whose initial sites fall out of favor retire from the competition and let others decide whether to persist advertising for their site or not. If you don't like my site, so be it. There is no ego involved. Now, Thomas Seeley actually has compared the collective decision making of honeybees with human decision making. In fact, he compares this to what he calls town meetings in the city of Bradford in Vermont. In that city, he observes, he's part of that, he says, once a year, a town meet, there's a town meeting day. And this is traditionally the Tuesday following the first Monday in March. All the citizens in the town come together in an open face-to-face -face assembly and render binding collective decisions or laws that govern the actions of everyone in the town. So this is an example of how humans make collective decisions. Now, by observing the bees and observing people in this, Seeley has extracted what he calls five habits of effective groups. What are the five habits of effective groups? Compose the decision-making group of individuals with shared interests and mutual respect. Minimize the leader's influence on the group thinking. So there's not one leader who's going to say, everybody do what I say. Every bee is free to go wherever she wants, find the side, dance honestly, and the best side will be. Seek diverse solutions to the problem. One bee doesn't go and say, I found a site, let's all go there. There are many things are considered. Aggregate the group's knowledge through debate. And use quorum response for cohesion, accuracy and speed rather than consensus. Now, it's in this book called Honeybee Democracy, Tom Seeley has a very nice section in which he says, after watching the bees and understanding their wisdom and watching the human beings, comparing the two and extracting these habits. Can we really learn? He said, can we actually put this to practice? And he says very nicely that when he came to this stage in his research, he was made head of the department. And when he became head of the department, he said, can I try to use this in conducting my departmental faculty meetings? So in departmental faculty meetings, as if this were not enough, as if this were not charming enough, Seeley tells us how he himself adopted these five habits of effective groups in conducting faculty meetings in his department when he became chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at Cornell University in Ithaca. So it is really possible to learn from this, provided we follow this strategy of first we decide what we want to do and then we turn to nature how we want to do. And therefore, I do not at all agree with philosophers who think that we should nature is dangerous, we should go away from it. In fact, we cannot throw the baby out of the bathwater. In fact, Edward Wilson has said that we have an innate preference for nature. He has called this biophilia. There are over 10 million biological species out there, each with potentially something to teach us. Natural selection has worked tirelessly for over 1.8 billion years to shape these species and endow them with diverse, exquisite properties. Edward Wilson has coined the inspiring term biophilia to describe our innate tendency to focus on the life and lifelike processes. Humanity is, this is, I'm quoting from Wilson, humanity is exalted not because we are so far above other living creatures, but because knowing them well elevates the very concept of life. The greatness of human beings is that they can know and learn from other forms of life. So there is no corner to hide outside nature. Do we really want to be so against nature that we shut ourselves in a corner and ignore all other species as potential sources of knowledge and wisdom just because we are afraid that someone will draw the wrong lessons and harm fellow human beings? We should not be so afraid. It would not be hope, I argue, the most intelligent species on the planet to be so terrified what we may discover about our co-inhabitants. Let us have self-confidence 
and raise our children to love fellow human beings and the rest of nature in equal measure and have the sapience to distinguish right from wrong. So we should not be afraid of committing the natural fallacy. We should really have the courage to do the things right. That brings me to the end of my talk. But I just want to say, Anindita already mentioned that I write this column. And in one of the articles in my column, I've actually described this particular uh, aspect of house hunting bees in great detail. Uh, in at this site, you can find this. So many more details which I could not bring into the lecture today. Actually, you will find in this column and similar things in other aspects of this column. Uh, I will stop here, Anindita, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. That was brilliant. I was actually thinking, you know, uh, just a couple of days back, I was speaking to a journalist and she was saying, uh, asking me, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, uh, do you agree about certain things that people say? And she was saying, oh, people try to say that, uh, you know, homosexuality is bad. Well, and some people say homosexuality is good because some, you know, they try to uh, give examples from nature. And then she said something very interesting. She said uh, that, uh, uh, you know, males peacock uh, because uh, it is there in our genes. It's there in nature. And is that uh, supposed to be what uh, we should be accepting? And is feminism bad because we should learn from nature? And, you know, listening to you, I was just thinking about this discussion that we had a few days back because she was, of course, not from the science background. And she was genuinely concerned that there are a lot of people who try to take this you know, examples from nature to say it's completely OK for, uh, you know, that, that uh, there to be dis distinction between the sexes and men should be uh, going around uh, strutting like peacocks and uh, uh, women should be allowed to, you know, pick the male and very uh, different notions from what feminists would portray so this just brought back that memory so uh yeah you know that there are questions simple, from the audience simple mathematical inequality ease is not equal to ought <laughs> yes that's all that is should be our mantra ease does not <laughs> yes, mean ought. just because it is it doesn't mean it should be yes So, uh, Nandita, are there so, questions yeah, that you're yeah, yeah. So, okay. you can see. Yeah. What when structural changes occur when a worker bee transforms into a queen bee? I think I'll stop sharing the screen so that I can. Or is it okay? Uh, it's okay either way. I think you can see the question, right? What structural changes occur when a worker bee transforms into a queen bee? Uh, I think, I think she means wasps. In the case of bees, the young larvae has to be fed on a special diet, which is generally called the royal jelly. And she enters into a different developmental pathway. Different kinds of genes get activated. And she becomes an adult bee, which is totally physiologically, morphologically, anatomically very different from a worker bee. But in the case of the wasp, an adult wasp can shift from being a worker wasp to a queen wasp. And here, there are no morphological changes, but yes, there are physiological changes. So we've actually measured this because we have studied this worker bee every day from the time the old queen is removed, where she becomes the potential queen, till she actually becomes a queen. Now, what is our definition of become a queen? When she lays her first egg. So from the day of removing the queen until the day the new queen lays her first egg, we have followed this potential queen every day. And we find that several changes happen. First of all, on the day zero, when the queen is removed, she's extremely aggressive. By the end of a week or so, she has lost all that aggression. First. Secondly, on the day the queen is removed, her ovaries are indistinguishable from any worker ovaries. At the end of the week, they have developed and she ovaries enough to be able to start laying eggs. Finally, the queen has a pheromone. And the worker has a different pheromone. So on day zero, the worker pheromone is indistinguishable from a, any other. The potential queen pheromone is indistinguishable from any other worker. By the end of the week, the potential queen's pheromone is indistinguishable from a queen's pheromone. So and the pheromone is a cocktail of many, many different compounds. And she develops this pheromone. So she drops her aggression, develops her ovaries, and develops the queen pheromone. These are the changes that happen in a wasp. 
from the time she becomes a potential queen till she becomes a real queen. Does epigenetics play a role apart from nutrition yes. in making of the queen bee? Okay. It has been very well studied in honeybees and ants and these uh, highly social insects where epigenetics plays a very important role. Remember that genetically there is no difference between a queen bee and a worker bee. In fact, you give me a, a deployed egg and I'll give you a worker or queen as you like because everything depends on the environment. In this particular case, on the larval so genetic, there are no genes which make a worker and make a queen. It is different in gene activation in which epigenetics plays a very So epigenetics has been fairly well studied in ant But we do not know what happens in these wasps because these changes are already in the adult stage. So there must be some changes in gene expression, like genes required to make proteins that go into the egg have to be there. But we still do not know whether epigenetic plays a role. But in ants and bees, yes, very well. Is there any conflict among the worker bees to decide who can be the queen bee? The again, I think she means the wasp. Yeah, so again, in the case of, only in the wasp this can happen. So there, can. yes, that is remarkable that there is no overt conflict. There does not seem to be a conflict. Somehow, see, there is potential for conflict. Normally, in the life cycle of the wasp, we see what I call conflict free succession. From one, you know, that I showed you that pedigree of 10 queens, one, two, three, four, that 10 times the queen chain. No, no evidence of conflict. This doesn't mean that there is no conflict. There is conflict, but they manage, they suppress it. And by doing experiments, we have exposed this. So we understand how they suppress this conflict, and if we disrupt that, we can actually see conflict in it. We can act. We have actually seen queens and workers fight with each other, but not normally by creating an artifice. In fact, in one very interesting experiment, what we did was we had two wasps. Both of them thought that they were the real queen. We made them. We fold them into both of them thinking that they're real queen by separating them temporarily, and then we brought them together. So both of them thought they were there, they fought. And in such cases, they can even kill each other. But in nature, you will never fight this. So what is beautiful about this boss is there is great potential for conflict, but it is managed so well that it doesn't get exposed, which is obviously is a very good thing for the function of the colony. In fact, I would say in future, if we want to learn more from this wasp, we must understand in more detail their conflict management strategies. If there was no conflict, then I would not be interested and they are not interesting for you because we have a lot of conflict. They also have a lot of potential for conflict, but they don't show it. That's what we have to learn from. Do the specific reasons behind the sudden aggressive behavior of a certain potential queen was? Yeah. So the potential queen <laughs> is very aggressive. Many, many more times aggressive than any other was or compared to herself in the presence of the queen. And of course we wondered, what is the function of the queen? Why does she become queen? So our obvious hypothesis was that when she is hyper, remember I told you in one week, she loses her aggression, develops her pheromone and starts laying. That means before she laid the first egg, she didn't have the pheromone. And that's when she was aggressive. So our common sense hypothesis was, she doesn't yet have the pheromone, so now she uses aggression to suppress everybody. Once she has the pheromone, she doesn't need aggression. This is the obvious hypothesis. Surprisingly, this hypothesis is not so. It does not look like the function of this hyperaggression is to suppress others. In fact, I think very unusual in happen. We have evidence for a very counterintuitive hypothesis. We have evidence that this aggression is needed for herself to develop her ovaries rapidly, to change her metabolism so that her ovaries develop rapidly. So the function of the hyperaggression seems to be to help her rapidly develop ovaries rather than to suppress her. In fact, we published a paper with the title that saying that we may have discovered a novel function for aggression. Normally, the function of aggression is 
towards the victim. And in fact, we have uh, we have we have agreed that people should pay more attention to the physiology of the aggressor and not just focus on the physiology of the victim. Uh, this was the last question. I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was remembering the experiments we did to prove that. <laughs> yes. And how we were thinking that hypothesis was the straw man, which ended up being the real reason behind the aggression. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Dondita, any of you have any questions for uh, for Sakadakar? Uh, not for now, ma'am. We have already posted there. Okay. So uh, I was uh, wondering uh, when you were talking about uh, this uh, uh, Seeley's experiments, and you know, we know that the honeybees are competing against each other and dancing honestly. Mm. So, uh, you know, this entire idea of the honest uh, signal that uh, that might be something that you could slightly elaborate for the students out here because. Uh, the, that's uh, something that is not really well understood uh, among many at the undergrad and grad, postgrad levels because honest signal is, uh, is not something we really teach at that level typically. Yeah, but there are two different contexts in which this is used. So here what we find is what is really interesting with the bees is that they have a method of assessing the absolute quality of the cavity they are found not relative. It's not that this is better than that. They're actually yeah. able to assess the absolute quality and their dance is correlated with what they measure. So there is no scope for cheating. They are not saying mine is better than yours. They are saying this is what mine is. I don't know what yours is. And if I visit your cavity, then I will know what yours is and I'll perform a different dance. So the dance, the strength of the dance is linked to a measurement of the absolute quality not the relative one. And that is why there is no uh, real conflict. And that is why, so that is why, you know, as soon as, for example, in human debate, as soon as I feel I'm losing, I will step up my aggression. I will pretend that this is more, more than what it is. So honeybees don't have a way of doing that. Their dance is linked to the what they have measured. And that is what makes it possible for them to arrive at this quorum rather rapid because so what happens then is that if other bees go suppose i bluff let's say let's say i assume i, I bluff because you know i have an ego and i want my side to be sitting but the bees which have followed my dance when they go and visit they will measure the absolute quality of that and they will dance according to that which will be weaker than my dance and therefore i lose out so bluffing doesn't help because so it's like saying I make an argument. If you like it, suppose you are having a discussion. I make one argument. Now I won't say anything. I make the argument. I keep quiet. Now if all three of you like my argument, then you speak in favor of my argument. If you don't like, you don't speak in favor of my argument. And somebody else's argument, if it is found in favor, more people will speak up, and therefore more and more people will prefer the particular thing. But there is of course a different uh, context in which we talk of on a signal and that is where individuals cannot bluff here the reason why they cannot bluff is that somebody else will go and find out what the true value of it is. but in many other contexts what happens is that animals cannot bluff because other individuals will detect this bluff very easily okay. so in order for example for example if i want to pretend let's say that two birds are fighting and I want to frighten my opponent by pretending to be very strong. And pretend to be strong, I puff off my body and I appear to gain. Now, this does not frighten my opponent because if my opponent attacks me, then I am not able to fight back as a strong individual. So, one cannot bluff. One signal has to be honest because it will be detected. In this case, the reason is very interesting, very different. It's not because that individual, because the final decision is based on other individuals. 
the other thing i was wondering is for the uh, honeybees again the nest hunting do yes. honeybees make mistakes is there evidence that there are also errors how error prone is this the in the sense mistakes. of the absolute judgment of the quality of the nest uh, sure of course you know others others will find out so suppose i grade uh, this nest uh, a 7 and you grade it a 6 uh, but uh, i mean i was just wondering if there are experiments which have tried to test uh, you know kind of measure the rate of error no, there would be a distribution. Suppose you okay. have many bees go to the same cavity. <coughs> now, their dance will not be identical. There will be a distribution. But the point is because there is an exponential increase in the number of bees dancing on one side and exponential decrease in the number of the other side, these mistakes are evened out. Right. If it is one bee, then you can have this problem. But since several bees are involved, you don't have it. But it's very interesting. Now, this has to be contrast. Remember, honeybees use the same dance language also when they find food. Yes. Okay. Now, several scout bees go, they find several trees in bloom, they come back and dance. But the difference is, there they don't have to come to a consensus. They don't all have to go to the same tree. They can distribute themselves and go off to different trees. Whereas in the case of house hunting bees, in the same dance, they have to come to a consensus or at least a quorum. Yes. That is the difference between food and uh, foraging for uh, dancing for food and dancing for a new nesting site okay so i guess uh, if there are no more questions i have also asked my questions <laughs> we can now wrap up so over yeah. to you nandita yes ma'am so thank you so much professor gadakar for the wonderful lecture and uh, also Dr. Bhadra for such an enlightening session for moderating it so, uh, so nicely. It was great to have you together in our platform. So thank you once again. Now I would request our mentor, Professor Inare Banerjee, to please uh, give the vote of thanks. So over to you, ma'am. You know, uh, before I have I've been to the probably I tell so that I have better connectivity. Probably I'm disconnected a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my my activity as would wish it to be. Uh, I had one one little question before I uh, uh, you. Sure. Um, I don't know if I'm audible. Am I audible or breaking? Uh, breaking uh, it's breaking it's okay. a bit. Yeah, uh, but it talk it is so remarkable. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I was. Uh, it is such a remarkable talk, and I I listened to the quip by Lindy that now with the gender question, uh, you know, being the list of. Uh, you know, uh, things that one needs to pay attention to. I wanted to ask that, uh, is the the female of the of this remarkable social, uh, you know, community sex uh, mm -hmm. only for reproduction, perpetuation of the species? Or is it also, you know, the wisdom of the high, uh, you know, something else? We would like to think of the female of the species uh, as something more than just Doctrinary. So you you explained it so remarkably that we always try to equate with the natural phenomenon and uh, justify many of our actions. I want to argue that uh, gender in a way, you know, trying to test more than I would like to interpret. Yeah, in the case of uh, ants, bees, and wasps, in fact, there is a danger of committing natural fallacy in thinking that only females can do these things because these are all female societies. In fact, the ant, bee and wasp societies are called feminine monarchies. In these groups, the males actually do not play any role in social life. They do not do anything except to donate sperm and die. It's all female. But of course, there are other species in which males. So again, as I said, we cannot learn from nature. We cannot copy from nature. But the fact remains, in all ants, bees and wasps, which are one of the most successful groups, the entire society is run by the female. That's why they're called feminine monarchies. But I'll tell you a very interesting story. Only recently, meaning about 200 years ago, we accepted this. 
but from aristotle up to 18th century everybody called believed that the honey bee colony is ruled by a king they they could not imagine that a female could rule the colony there is patriarchy they for it, you they always called it the king yeah. and only in 1700 something they actually proved that she has eggs in her the king has eggs in his body that's when they accepted that it's a female and not only that the most interesting thing is there were political debates in england there were some people who said how can a woman rule england how can we have queen elizabeth because even in bees it's the king <laughs> okay <laughs> this is the argument they use they use the arg- so this is the ultimate naturalistic fallacy they said even in honey bees it's the male who rules therefore in humans it should be the male <laughs> they actually got their facts also wrong so not only they committed naturalistic fallacy but they also committed other kinds of things it took long time for people to accept that female but today of course we know that's why we call them feminine monarchies this name was invented in uh, was created in the 17th century and now we know that they all run indeed and because it is a haplodiploid species the uh, even the worker and diploid individuals there's the concept of super sisters yes. that by re- a come Community, uh, you know, offspring uh, and ensures the perpetuation of yes. genes. So I think, Professor Gagar, you should be one in all, you know, related uh, in your, you know, wisdom. Uh, time over interpreting something, especially uh, now we want to interpret it to be one to, and uh, the day. Content is key. Like from your lectures, one can understand and uh, interpret not as is convenient, but as it should. So thank you so much for the full lecture. Thank you, Anindita. Uh, uh, thanking you, uh, Anindita, enough for uh, that hug that is to you. It happened, and thank, thank you so you. much, Professor. Got hope thank meet in person, sure. and what wonderful sun evening all spent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dita, for modeling. It's so nice. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So. So for our viewers, thank you for listening to our talk. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our Facebook page uh, to stay updated on our upcoming events. Thank you once again and take care.